Welcome back. In today's video, I'm going to show you the battery module tester that I've built. I uh, have lots of cell testers that we've bought. Um, I made this cell tester, which I'll show you later in the video. Um, but today's video is primarily about this resistor load bank that I made. To get started, I bought some 18 gauge nichrome wire, some copper bus bar, and some bakelite or phenolic plate to use as an insulator. The battery that I want to test is 48 volts, so with a 4 ohm resistance that would give me 12 amps, 2 ohms would give me 24 amps, 1 ohm would give me 48 amps. And I might want to use this resistor on a 12 volt battery, so I want to be able to reconfigure the resistors in series or parallel depending on the voltage. The resistivity of the nichrome wire that I'm using is 0.423 ohms per foot, so that means my resistor will be 9.5 feet long. If I divide that into 16 sections, each section would be about 7 inches long. So this is the basic layout of the resistor. Here I'm machining the phenolic plate, it's also called Bakelite. It has a melting point of around 500 Fahrenheit, which is one of the highest for plastics. That's the reason I'm using it, because I know it's going to get hot. Instead of gluing the material down while I machine it, I'm leaving little tabs to hold the material in place while I machine it, and they just snap apart. To machine the copper bus bars, I'm machining the fixture to hold them first, and that will ensure that the CNC knows exactly where the zero position is, so that my holes are all centered. I'm adding two threaded holes so I can bolt down the bus bar. Well, this is way easier than trying to drill these by hand and much more accurate. I can also let the machine work while I'm assembling the rest of the resistor. This was my first attempt at lacing up the nichrome wire. It was a little loose. Here I'm trying to kind of stretch it out. Here I'm checking the length. It's supposed to be seven inches and I may want a quarter inch over, but close enough. The resistance of my meter leads is about 0.5 ohms, so measuring 4.6 means that it's really about 4.1 ohms. This is my first attempt at applying power to the resistor. I didn't realize how much longer the wires were gonna grow once they got hot. So I decided to relace them with a little more tension. The wire is really stiff, so it doesn't really wanna slide over the bolt. I found this wiggle technique helps get the slack out. Well, the wires look much cleaner now that I've relaced it, and I took the extra length out to make it closer to 4 ohms. But as soon as I put power through, everything got stretched out again anyway. This is 48 volts into 2 ohms, so about 24 amps. If I were to do this again, I'd obviously increase the pitch between the wires. So I have the resistor mounted in a frame on the floor with a fan shroud around it and I have a giant blower behind for cooling. Here I'm just using the top half of the resistor, so two ohms. The second half is two ohms, so if I want to double or have the current, I can. I also have the option of changing resistance by 0.25 ohms by using all the different taps. The battery is connected to the resistor through this circuit, which is basically a 100 amp dimmer switch. That's a solid state relay. I'm using a function generator to turn the relay on, which will flow current. This function generator allows me to change the switching frequency and the duty cycle. The higher the duty cycle, the longer the relay is on and the more current will flow to the resistor. I'm powering all this with a USB battery. You can buy these USB-C circuit boards, which have jumpers that let you select what voltage output you want. So. I made this one to be 15 volts. These are super convenient. When you're pulse width modulating current, sometimes it's really hard to get an accurate reading because it's fluctuating so much. So I have an analog meter here, which is a little bit easier to read than a digital. 
The ammeter is actually just a voltmeter measuring voltage drop across the resistor, which indicates current. I'm using an old iPhone to connect to the battery management system for my battery. It displays the voltage of all the cells, and it also displays watts and amps. Here I can turn the power on for the battery, and we can start flowing some current here. I'm ramping up the duty cycle, here's 100%. And you can really see those wires elongating from the heat. The BMS is shown we're pulling about 22 amps and about 1060 watts and that's only half of the resistor. The wires are glowing bright orange so I'm going to go around the back and turn on the fan. The fan really makes a big difference. So I just added these jumper wires here and here. So now I have two sets of parallel resistors. I'm going to switch the power on and I have the PWM set for 25%. It looks like that's about 7 amps. Let's crank it up to 50%. That looks like it's about 17 amps. The BMS will protect the battery at 30 amps and shut off, so let's see how close we can get to that. But notice that the cell voltages are bouncing all over the place. That's called aliasing. The voltage is being measured at an instant in time, and that in that instant, there could be a load applied or it could be an open circuit. Here I'm increasing the frequency to try and smooth out that current ripple. As you can see, the voltages have smoothed out until it faulted on overcurrent. Here's a steady state condition, just barely glowing red. We're pulling about 17 amps. 840 watts, and it's about 50% duty cycle. Here's another steady state, glowing orange. We're pulling about 28 amps, 1300 watts, and 75% duty cycle. And with the fan turned on, the fan pretty much cools it instantly. All right, we're going for 100% here. Here we're pulling 44 amps into 1 ohm, so it's about 1.9 kilowatt. With the fan repositioned, the elements are barely glowing red. So now I'm curious to see how much power I can actually pull. I move the cables to a uh, tap that's 0.5 ohms less, so instead of 2 ohms, they're 1.5, and they're in parallel, so it's 0.75 ohms. Here we're cranking up the power, and we've maxed out the gauge, and I'm trying to dial down the current, but it seems like the IGBT is dead short now. Playing back in slow motion, we can see the instant that the solid state relay dies. As I'm turning the current down, you can actually see the current decrease on the ammeter, and then all of a sudden the light turns off on the solid state relay and the gauge is pegged again. I'm going to have to use my emergency disconnect here in a second. I was looking at the elements and they looked like it was a sustainable level of current. I didn't get it on video very long, but it's looking pretty good. I'm going to need both hands to disconnect the power, so putting the phone down for a second. Looks like our solid state relay is dead. We're feeding it a pulse signal, but the red light's not blinking. IGBTs typically fail in a short circuit, which is what we're seeing here. The original goal of this project was to pull 30 amps to test a battery, and we were pulling 58 amps, which is almost two and a half kilowatts, so I guess I can't complain, although I am disappointed that my 100 amp switch died at only 60. Real quick, here's another load resistor bank that I made. It's basically two 1 ohm resistors in either series or parallel. So I can pull either 2 amps, 4 amps, or 8 amps on a 4 volt battery. Well, thanks again for watching. Uh, hopefully, you found this informative. Uh, there isn't a lot of information about sizing nichrome wire for heating loads, so 
I'll post whatever information I can about the wire that I used. And uh, thanks again for watching. I promised I'd try and toast some bread or marshmallows, so we'll see how that turns out. Thanks again for watching. I think this is the best I'm going to do before the battery dies.